Let's go to Parliament now. Uh, let's see how quickly we can deal with that matter. The minority appears, feels that it's under siege, and they have issued a statement. The NDC, as a party, also issued a statement. The, they had an emergency meeting yesterday. They also issued a statement. Uh, all of that on the back of attacks at the minority, particularly one also coming from Sami Jemfi, the communications officer, calling them people who have betrayed the party and are not in touch with Ghanaians because of the three people that were um, approved who as, uh, appointments were in question. Once again, this show is brought to you by Bank of Africa, strong as a group and close as a partner, MT and everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Duraplas, where Duraplas goes, water flows. Heavy mosquito spray and coil. Pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects. And Napa food, it is tasty. DBS Industries. Robert and Sons Limited Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care services provider. Uh, on this note again, let me go to um, the Google man, <laughs> uh, Professor Sari. So, like I said in my introduction, people have been excited that we have a parliament that is, if you like, hung, split right in there. And so when they were vetting the ministers and the manner in which they went about it and eventually told us that three of them had issues, uh, it was expected that not all of them would be approved and that there was a sense in the public that one particular person didn't deserve to be a minister and yet all of them went through. Now they are in trouble. They are being accused of taking money. Some say, well, they are broke in opposition and so they have uh, debts to pay and all of this. So they've, <coughs> they've not been happy at all. I read some of their statements to you. But what do you say? <clears throat> Well, you know, uh, something, uh, such unhappiness, uh, it's part of the political process. People are allowed to express their opinions about what happens or what is happening in parliament. So I don't see any problem with the unhappiness. And I dare say the unhappiness is probably not limited to people in NDC. There may be some in NPP who are also unhappy. Uh, perhaps uh, they are not able to express their feelings as loudly as some of those in the uh, N, uh, NDC. Uh, such unhappiness happens everywhere, even in the United States, it's happening. You know, within the Democratic Party, there are people lobbying. You know, we have the uh, Bernie Sanders wing of the party and then the moderate wing of the party and so on. And each wing has a list of people that they want to see in Biden's cabinet. One person, I believe, uh, has been withdrawn because the senators signaled that they were not going to approve of the domination. So these this are healthy. I, I really see nothing wrong. And I'm going to allow the politicians to comment more on that but allow me to make a few points uh, that I, I, I wrote down while watching one. I only watched one of the vetting, and even that I watched because I was watching the Supreme Court proceedings and then there was a break. And so the only thing I could watch was the vetting. It was unfortunate that that was also the time that uh, Madame Hawa Kunsin uh, was being vetted. So uh, by accident, I happened to watch hers. What is parliament actually doing with vetting? To me, they are evaluating a person's qualification, a person's temperament, a person's policy grasp, a person's policy preferences, and whether or not there are any conflict of interest. This is, these are serious issues. And as you can see from the constitution, the appointment of a minister is joint activity, the president nominates, parliament approves. Parliament is not supposed to rubber stamp whatever, whoever the president brings. They should test each of those things that are enumerated. And so it imposes burdens on everyone. 
First, the nominees have to be honest to themselves. If you are a nominee and the president appoints you to a position that you don't have the expertise, you owe a duty to the president to deny, to, to reject that nomination. So for instance, if I was sitting here and the president called me and said, Prof, I want you to come back home and be the minister of fisheries. I'll tell the president all I know about uh, fishing is I eat fish. That's all. I don't know anything about fisheries. I'll be a disaster. And I don't want to humiliate you by going to face these parliamentarians and they ask me questions and I look lost. So the nominees themselves have to be a little honest to themselves and not expose the president to you know, this type of ridicule that comes in when they appear before the committee and they don't know what they are talking about. Likewise, the president also has the duty to do some screening so that people that he sends to parliament are not exposed in the manner that some of the ministers, I think, in, I, 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 maybe I, I, may, I, I want to mention her name, but I'm how Kunsin was exposed with some of the questions that were uh, put to her, uh, to her. Finally, the MPs themselves make an oath to confirm only qualified people. And to me, it's somehow a violation of the oath to actually confirm someone knowing that that person is not qualified. We have to treat the country, the country with a little bit of seriousness. So if a person shows up and by his or her answers to questions that are uh, asked of her, show that he has no clue what the ministry that he or she is being assigned to, what they do, then by all means, the person should not be all right. uh, confirmed. Thank you very finally, much. Finally, yeah. finally, let me make a final point, Samson. I want to draw a distinction between the way we appoint our ministers and the way ministers are appointed under the Westminster style. In the Westminster style, parliament has no rule. The, pres the prime minister chooses ministers from among members of parliament. And as a result of that, the ministers can be reshuffled very easily. Our approach mirrors the American approach where ministers are vetted for specific positions. So the only thing I want to add and I want to emphasize is we must start thinking about the proper role of reshuffling in our system of appointing ministers. If I'm a minister who has been vetted for fisheries, can the president then reshuffle me to, attorney, uh, to the attorney general's department? I think not. And uh, we need to really resolve that. If uh, someone who has been vetted for fisheries is a lawyer, duly qualified, uh, the president should be able to reshuffle them to the attorney general. Uh, the attorney general's uh, ministry is one that the constitution uh, clearly circumscribes. Because, you see, because you've not been vetted for the position of Attorney General. You've been vetted for the position of Ministry of Fisheries. Okay, thank you. If you were yeah. nominated so for Rena, the Attorney General's right. So, Rena, um, Sami Janfi began all of this, and if you follow the, the opposition, if you like, opposition, uh, pro-opposition media, they have taken them to the cleanest. I'm talking about the minority members. They ask the question, how on earth did you end up supporting the NPP, who would vote for the nominees anyway? And that's a presumption that may not be exactly accurate. How did you support them to vote for people that you, you gave the impression to the whole world that were not qualified? You know, Sami Jenfi said, the betrayal we have suffered in the hands of the Speaker of Parliament, Abam Babi, the leadership of our parliamentary group, particularly <clears throat> Haruna Idrisu, Muntaka Mubarak, and dozens of our MPs, is what strengthens me to work hard for the great NDC to regain power. They, they brazenly defy the leadership of the party and betray the collective good for their selfish interest. And we must not let them succeed in their parochial quest to destroy the NDC, the party 
that has done so much for them and all of us. The shame they have brought on the party will forever hang like an, an albatross around their necks. Then he brings in what he thinks uh, people were expecting generally, and these people have failed. And then you hear the commentary around, you know, imputing corruption among others, and they have been forced to also issue statements. Okay. Um, something, uh, under normal circumstances, I, because of my loyalty and commitment to, my, to the NDC party, I desist from making public comments that denigrate or that tend to tear the party apart. Uh, but insofar as some actions uh, of leadership, uh, I don't know how it came about, but insofar as some actions uh, tend to have future repercussions on the fortunes of the party, I think I'm entitled on it. It's on that basis that I'm going to make uh, my submission. And I also make my submission as a grassroots person. I may be sitting here and speaking uh, law with my friend, uh, <laughs> but fundamentally, I am, I am I'm a grassroots person. So I'm as head as any of the grassroots people. Uh, at the time that we were building momentum, uh, you know that the events of 7th, uh, in the morning of 7th, or if you like, uh, midnight of 6th uh, of, uh, of January, uh, the NDC Minority Caucus had created uh, some semblance of unity uh, and togetherness, uh, uh, as we have seen in other, other places. You know, even the, even the, and I expected that same solidarity to exist going forward for two reasons. Because I believe so that it is not just the NDC minority or people who are affiliated or people who have interest in NDC affairs who are interested in what has happened both on the sixth of January and then on the 3rd of March. There are, if you were to do um, a census or some poll, survey. a survey, okay, to find out how many Ghanaians would actually have wanted some of the nominees, like Howard Kumisen, to be dropped, you are going to have a resounding majority number of, of Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. Because there are many Ghanaians that are actually looking for substance. They want their material well-being to, to improve, and they vote because of some of these things. The least they can have is to have someone impose on them who doesn't have, uh, uh, from what appears publicly, graphs of basic issues of, of I was questioning, was I, I, look, I'm from a Greek background as well, so I know how the industry can be complicated, even how to deal with the local population. There are issues of conflict within the fishing community. She needs the skills of ADR, you know, attentive, you know, she needs to be able to engage. Uh, the fishing sector is one area where you have, for instance, many, many, many conventions, international conventions and instruments and bilateral agreements because of shrouding waters and uh, the, the, the manner in which the resource is distributed across Among borders. those that were slated to be rejected, she got the highest votes. Um, yeah, so that <laughs> is, that, that's, uh, thanks for, for, for bringing my attention to that, which is surprising. So. Now, the base of our party is hurt because of two reasons. One, the minority itself wrote some thesis and theorized why certain people should be rejected. That's right. That was within a week. So you had a principled position on the basis of qualifying criteria that you would think you designate these nominees as being incompetent or lacking in competence or merit, whatever it is, to be approved to be ministers of our state. Then within a week, you make a U-turn. That's problematic. It smacks of uh, inability to stay together on course or to stay on principle. And that hurts. Look at Donald Trump. Look at what Trump did on the same seat when he vandalized America's democracy. Uh, and the Capitol Hill, okay. his, people, his people still stood by him. You know that. Mm -hmm. The Republicans still stood by him. He got votes. He was not impeached despite that. That's unity. But we, as a party now, are in a very difficult situation. And no one should think 
that 2024 is some distant future. It starts now. You build momentum immediately after the elections and build it. We were having public goodwill, good faith from the Supreme Court. We were to accept it, no matter what the outcome is. Then we move to the base, and then we are doing well in parliament, and we are holding uh, the executive to account. The, one of the problems we have always had mm. uh, throughout the, 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 the fourth parliament has been the overbearing power of the executive. So this was the only occasion that we were thinking, and many Ghanaians of, of goodwill were hoping that we could not only this, because, and this frightens me, so going forward, what kind of bills are going to pass through parliament? What bills, because is it for, does it foretell the future that uh, we're going to have the, uh, the, the uh, Japas read their ugly heads again? Is that what is going to Why happen? Why do we appear to discount the fact that for a number of those, I think they were sworn in yesterday, last night, about 28, 29 of them. Yes. For a number of them to be, not to receive consensus. Okay. And to be subjected to vote. Okay. You don't think that is also significant? That you have become a minister not by consensus of but, your but, colleagues. But, but, but that's, that's, that's a good point to raise. But I need to say that it depends on how strong you are on a principle. Once you believe on the basis of qualification criteria, then so be it. Otherwise, we now create this precedent that whoever the president nominates becomes a minister. That's problematic. True or false? I, I, so I, you, you would expect that the president himself would have done his background work uh, based on he's, done, he's been president for four years. He would have practical knowledge of the competence of these people. He would have worked with them. There are always supervisory notes from the chief of staff who is doing well, who is not doing well. So I'm surprised. And if, you look, well, if I want to comment generally on the list that he has submitted to parliament, you notice that there are people who are very loyal. I think the president just went for loyalty, besides any other thing. I know, I have friends who are MPP. If they Educium, wanted... Educium Education I have Ministry. Friends, look, hold on, hold on. Uh, Educium Education Ministry. Is it a question yeah, of loyalty? Perfect. Oh, perfect. Is it lo loyalty? No, no, I mean, he's a perfect uh, choice for the, for the area. Atten like Attorney General, go for yeah, Of course, maybe my statement may be sweeping. But that is just to say that, well, but loyalty compared to uh, computers, that's a good thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Co a combination of computers yeah. and loyalty. Okay. But some of them clearly, as we have seen in the, uh, pro the, 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 uh, the output, you know, the vetting output, it, it leaves no one in doubt uh, as to uh, yeah, whether so, they should be there. So, so let me ask you how. So I so, think it's a lost opportunity. Mm. Uh, my conclusion remarks on this is it's a lost opportunity. And I don't know how they're going to. Uh, uh, survive or revive the spirit that the nation felt uh, going forward and what will happen to bills that are going to come before them. And finally, let me say that I like comrades to calm down. Uh, we cannot be writing letters to each other. Uh, this shows that there was no strategy going into the matter of the nominations. And they should learn from their own example that when they showed resilience and strategy on the seat, they won. And I want that to happen. Uh, there were honorables. I would have gone for their heads, but there has to be changes. Mm. Okay. Now, let's listen to uh, two of the people in the NDC from parliament and out of parliament, two people. Let's, let's listen to what they have to say. I never voted any of them. And if they bring them a million times, I'm not going to vote them. I don't have anything personal against them. But I think that they are each unfit to be ministers of state. Some of them lied under oath. So I can understand the pain the anger of our rank and file. If they didn't love the NDC, I don't think they would be wor worried. They loved the NDC. Some suffered for the NDC. We are members of parliament. I was scandalized that some of them got more votes than the number of MPs that the NPP the has. Commission obtained 60 percent. 24 of, of our members voted for our commission. Right. It's absolutely preposterous. And I find it extremely difficult to comprehend. So you have betrayed the party. Is that what it is? Well, if we, if we failed to do what the rank and file of the party expected us to do, we should not be run away from blame. I have had people who call and express their anger, particularly a lot of the, the platforms. We just need to exercise patience. We just need to talk to them. I have received a lot of attack. Maybe perhaps to a very large extent, maybe my conscience believed that I wouldn't do such a thing. 
but I have had people who call and express their anger, particularly a lot of the, the platform. If some of them feel expressed an opinion, it may go down well with people, others and not everybody, but he expressed his opinion and he said it as it is. Personally, and I think that I, 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 I speak for a lot of our, our people, we are all not very happy with what has happened in Parliament. We think that our parliamentarians could have done better. We think that the parliamentarians should have weighed or, 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 or measured the temperament and the tension within the system and has maybe modified their way of handling issues. The parliamentarians will have to look at their strategy again and see the best way to balance doing their national work in parliament and also assuaging the feelings and the pains of our, 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 our uh, rank and file. So you had Mutala Muhammad and Baba Jamal there. Now, the reasons that they had uh, issued for not approving, uh, agreeing on consensus for these uh, uh, three nominees, uh, Hawa Kumsin, uh, uh, Dr. Uswe Friye Akoto, and um, Kojo Opon Kroma. Hawa Kumsin, the fourth reason was that the minister-designate displayed an alarmingly abysmal lack of knowledge on the sector she was nominated for, making her unfit for the portfolio and therefore untenable to secure the approval of the members of the NDC caucus. Dr. Uswe Friyakoto, they had a number of issues against him. And then the fourth issue, they said the minister-designate was particularly discourteous, downright condescending, and offensively arrogant in his appearance at the committee, which is not the kind of attitude expected of a public servant. But he had other substantial matters, which was not about his conduct. They said he was untruthful under oath about his directive ordering GPHA to issue a license to Fruit Terminal Company Limited and how his actions could lead to a 50 million US judgment debt. Kojo Pong Kroma, they had a number of issues. They said the minister designate for information, now his minister, was not the least candid with the committee on the multiple infractions of the law leading to the Bank of Ghana's revocation of the license of over microfinance, a company in which he was 83% majority shareholder. He failed to admit ethical liability for the related party lending between over microfinance and West Brownstone, which also belongs to him. He also denied outstanding obligations to over microfinance despite the Bank of Ghana's examination report establishing the contrary. He peddled on truth under oath about the circumstances leading to the investigative to investigative journalist Manasse Azuri Awinis relocation to South Africa with the assistance of Media Foundation for West Africa. And maybe one more of uh, what they had against him. They said the nominee was quite evasive on his association with MX24 TV, which is owned and managed by his wife, with other family members, such as Kwabna Opon Nkrumah, serving as shareholder trustee for the parent company of MX24 TV, known as Black Voter Publications Limited, incorporated recently, uh, 4th of April 2017, when the nominee was serving as deputy minister for information. So the question is, if this is what they had to say about them, how do they turn round to give their approval in such numbers? Uh, I think you first have to also look at um, the Constitution's prescription for qualification or qualification criteria for ministers of state. And first of all, the Constitution, apart from the Attorney General, who many agree, I was recently told that some people think a person who is not a lawyer can be an attorney general. Well, that's a debate that can be made. 
but with the exception of the Attorney General, the Constitution does not prescribe that the approval must be in reference to a particular sector. It only says at Article 78, Ministers of State shall be appointed by the President with a prior approval of Parliament from among members of Parliament or persons qualified to be elected as members of Parliament. So the question you ask is, what are the qualification criteria for members of Parliament? So if a person qualifies to be a member of parliament, then he qualifies generally to be a minister of state. So and I put some note down in reference to Hawa Yakubu. Mm. And I say that. Hawa Kumsen. Hawa Kumsen. I wonder, a lot of people make that mm. <laughs> have So rest in peace. Hawa Kumsen. It looks like the, the main reason that you spelled out mm. was about the fact that she did not exhibit knowledge in the sector. So I put down, so not that she is not competent as a minister of state, but she did not exhibit competence to be in that sector. And I think that if you go through the constitution, therefore, that it means that all that parliament needs to do is, or the appointment committee, is to ascertain whether or not first, under Article 94, the person is qualified to be a member of parliament. If he's already a member of parliament, of course, that does not mean that then he must just go through. There are certain things that you can look at for. But obviously, the constitution didn't state that moral standing should be a qualification. It is only in reference to judges. The Supreme Court judges, the Chief Justice, that is, moral standing is specifically mentioned as well. But the qualification to be MP includes moral turpitude. No, not that I'm aware of. Article. It is there. It is there. Okay. Let's it is there. So moral standing is part of it. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And again, if you have been convicted of an act of dishonesty or something like that. But yeah. there are exceptions under the same 94 mm. that if you serve your term and, I mean, some additional term, that disqualification criteria is taken away. Okay, so when you are vetting a person or the constitution uses the word approving of the nomination by the president, you just have to look at whether or not he is qualified to be a minister of state. Of course, the president may have presented the person to be in charge of a particular ministry, but that is the fact that the president also has the power to reshuffle because you need not vet the person for that specific ministry or sector alone. So that answers perhaps the issue that Prof is. But I think the NDC must also remember that. But for some members of MPP to have voted for their preferred speaker, <coughs> their preferred speaker wouldn't have been voted. At that time, they were very happy, and I was happy. I said it openly, that this is what we expect, that People are sent to parliament not just to represent the party, but they are the people who voted for them. So are we now saying that Mr. Haruna Idrisu's people and his people, I don't know whether he voted this way or that way, are we saying that they did not vote according to what their people want or the side that their people wanted them to, to vote for? They, are we saying that they did not listen to their own constituents and voted against the wishes of their own constituents. That's exactly what they are saying. Well, as it stands now, we have heard a few in Accra and other places expressing this view. I have not heard. They, they brought the report. We didn't ask them to do that. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying that. That they report. For how are you? Let me read further. Okay. They said um, the minister designate for fisheries and aquaculture development could not provide convincing grounds for the shooting incident during the voter registration exercise in Kaswa mm -hmm. on 20th July 2020, even though we acknowledge her belated apology for her reckless, dangerous conduct. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, claims of an ongoing investigation by the police and uh, did not come across as credible, considering that there has been no update from the police for more than eight months after the unfortunate incident. Our checks also point to the fact that she has not provided any statement to the police as of yet. 
The committee, the nominee confirmed the identity of close associates who have unleashed a reign of terror on helpless political appoint opponents mm. in the pursuit of their narrow political ends. Well, so, so they say she's unfit. So, I mean, you, you mentioned the moral terms. Article 94 2 is about the person who has been convicted of high crime under the constitution offense involving dishonesty, fraud, dishonesty, and moral turpitude. Exactly. So the person must have been convicted first. If the person has not been convicted of whatever crime we can call moral turpitude, you cannot use it. That's my view. Okay. Now, so in actual fact, um, there, there are concerns that must be raised. People may not be happy with the performance or otherwise. But if you look at this lady, she was giving one of the important flagship programs to manage. I mean, Special the, the ambulances and mm. all those ones. I think people are, to some extent, satisfied. Yes, we all sometimes face issues when you are going to face a panel. I mean, no matter how intelligent you may be, even going to the court, you go to the Supreme Court, and all your preparations that hmm. you have done may evaporate. They can because throw you off completely. When they start <laughs> throwing the questions at you, it even happen. No, so so, so, so what, are, what are you saying? What are you so saying? My point, that, my point. That, that the vetting exercise is what? Is to rubber stamp what no, the president No, what I'm saying is that, in fact, this, this last vetting, in, in, as I can recollect, has been the most rigorous since 1993. What, to what effect? The effect is that, at least, it has brought out matters, some of which I, I say that were not within the remit, but we, it has been exposed. The end should not necessarily be that the people should be rejected, unless it violates the constitution. Like, some have been rejected in the past because they were not even a registered voter. I think one person was, if I can recollect. But that aside, it is so important to bring these matters up, conflict of interest. Mm. There are other remedies okay. where, for example, there's conflict of interest and the person was a minister. But just to say the last thing that parliament itself has the tool to apply. When a person, again, you know the power of censure. When a minister of state violates any of the... Um, or, I mean, he gauges in conflict of interest or anything that parliament can apply as being a ground for censure. Parliament can, can do that. Unfortunately, we do, did not in the past see that parliament had ever applied su such, such, a, such a tool, which they could have done an articulated tool. Parliament, by, by resolution supported by votes of not less than two thirds of all members of parliament pass a vote of censure on a minister of state. Hmm. So if you are accusing them now of engaging in certain acts for which you could have brought or you could have invoked this very important power or authority, you didn't. Of course, crime has no expiry date. But you wait till the person comes before you and then you want to use it beyond the threshold that is established under, in my view, Article 94, then it may not also be, uh, be unfair. I Let's think they should continue yeah. to have faith in the leadership. Mm. For me, they have uh, done very well. Uh, let's, that one good let, turn deserves mm. another. Let's, let's get to Dr. Abochi. And, um, uh, well, <laughs> there, are, there are people who are really very angry. If you monitor social media and elsewhere, and I decided to do something. Mm. Sami Jamfi's statement, I went to his page on Facebook, mm -hmm. And on his page alone, you had, you could say, aggregating the people who had come there to comment and everything, you have almost a million people oh. on his page alone. Uh, in excess of a thousand people have shared his comments, mm. meaning they like it. Mm. Now, all other platforms, you can imagine how other people are also feeding on it on various places and even the publications. You have heard Kwesi Pratt very angry mm. that this is not what we voted for. We thought that this will be a parliament that will hold the executive in check. And if a parliament that is split right there in the middle cannot, then we are doomed. What do you say? Well, I think, first of all, we tend to underestimate 
the, uh, the back channel activities that go on in Parliament. There are a lot of trade-offs and a lot of political maneuverings that go on behind the scenes in Parliament, and these tend to ultimately influence outcomes. It's important, first of all, to appreciate the fact that the NDC sees itself as a government in waiting. It is hoping to become the government in the future. And in that respect, therefore, things they do today, they invariably have an eye on tomorrow. Now, the polit this mixed together with the political maneuverings and the trade-offs implies that the members of parliament of the NDC may themselves be taking decisions today, expecting that whatever dynamic parliament turns out to be in 2024, should they be in government, they will probably have to fall back on parliament, given the precedence that is set today. Now, I also say this again, the fact that the members of parliament, the people who appear before them, I'm talking about the nominees, a good number of them are members of parliament. So these are colleagues. So in spite of the optical things we see on TV, in spite of the rightful questions that are asked and the probings that are engaged in, ultimately these are colleagues and they will be happy or some will be happy to exact political revenge on the cameras. But when it comes to the decision making, they invariably may pass them. Similar things happen in interviews where you may have very probing questions asked at the interview itself, but ultimately a candidate is allowed to go through because in the end, um, the, the, the questions that have to be asked are asked. People have exacted a revenge they want to exact and they will not necessarily obstruct the process. So I think what we're seeing reflects those political dynamics, a lot of which go on behind the scenes. That is where members of parliament are friends. That is where members of parliament fight for the bottom line. And that bottom line is to remain in parliament and then for ministers to ultimately be given the nod to become ministers. So it is a real politic. And the real politic dimensions of things invariably tend to defeat principles. But it also reflects one thing. And I think the reaction reflects one thing. What it does reflect is to also see a certain schism gradually developing between the base and the members of parliament. The base may have their own expectation. And the fact that there is this rather radical reaction reflects the fact that the base, or rather the members of parliament, are not necessarily in tune and in sync with the base. But this may also then reflect a larger issue. Under what circumstances should members of parliament consult the base? In other words, are there decisions that are purely driven by principle, that are purely driven by certain high level thinking that the member of parliament in whom confidence is reposed by the electorates, by reason of which he's been elected, is allowed to exercise judgment. If the member of parliament is allowed to exercise judgment, then presumptively the member of parliament is not entitled or is not obliged to go and consult the base. So under what circumstances are members of parliament given that prerogative and given that uh, presumptive knowledge to make decisions without necessarily consulting the base. And under what circumstances must members of parliament consult the base? Now, given that our, our, our democracy is developing and we're still not that very, very sophisticated, I think that there could be consequences where there's a clear case of schism between members of parliament or between parliament as a body and the base. But it's, it's a learning curve again, that, and I'm sure given the development now, we're going to probably see all kinds of tendencies and consequences moving forward. But having said this, let me just say that it's important for us to also appreciate the whole essence of vetting. So the vetting is designed to, as it were, check the nominee, the potential nominee, but benchmark the potential nominee against clear constitutional standards. And the constitutional standards, if you look at the constitution, clearly vetting is designed to elicit three things. Uh, things. Uh, uh, Dr. Abuchi, your, your line is breaking, uh, but you are taking us back to what you told us uh, earlier when we discussed this issue and, and sought to find out what the essence of the vetting at all is, if there was any importance to it. So let's try again. Let's see if we can hear you clearly. It is to okay. do three things. What are the three things again? So the three things are listed were the fact of capacity or competence, and then capacity or competence, and then credibility, and then finally eligibility. And I'm sorry for my poor 
uh, connection. It's okay. Now, the, the issue of capacity or competence, so I think that has been mentioned by one of the panelists, the fact of whether the person can undertake the functions of his office. And the functions of the office, I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, Prof mentioned earlier that when people are being appointed, when they are being reshuffled, they must go back to parliament. I, I respectfully hold a different view. Now, if you pay careful attention to the constitution, the constitution says the ministers of state shall be appointed subject to the prior approval of parliament. So it is ministers of state. Everybody who is appointed is a minister of state. He's not a sector minister. The sector is only indicated for purposes of making the work of parliament easier in terms of parliament having to ask the right questions. But the appointment itself is a generic appointment. So all appointees to the positions of ministers, they are all appointed ministers of state on the face of it. That means that you are appointed a minister of state and you are qualified in principle to occupy any office. And so when you are appointed a minister of state for say agriculture, the sector of agriculture, and you are vetted for agriculture, of course, you are not going to, the president is not going to lie to parliament. So after that, the minister of state will assume the office of agriculture. But if the president decides to change that person from agriculture somewhere else, the president doesn't need another parliamentary approval because the appointment is for qualification as a minister, qua minister. You are appointed as a minister who qualifies and who is competent enough to sit in the position of minister, in the ministerial position across the board and across the spectrum. But, and so but, it's but, but, but the, the, the nomination doesn't go wholesale and the vetting is restricted to a specific portfolio. And, and that's the point I made. That is just operational. That, that, that has been by practice. That is not constitutional. The constitution doesn't restrict the appointee to a particular ministry, mm -hmm. but it is just parliamentary operational processes. It is okay. just the relationship between parliament mm -hmm. and the executive that has seen this practice, mm -hmm. where every ministerial nominee who is nominated mm -hmm. um, is actually nominated for a sector. But the president can nominate someone to go for vetting without an attachment to a ministry. So, so a person can be appointed as a minister of state. He goes through the appointment. All right, uh, we, we lost uh, Dr. Abochi there, but um, if once we establish uh, contact with him, I'll put my very final question to him, then we will be able to take a break and return to look at the election petition judgment. Um, yes, uh, I will take a break right now and return. I have uh, some messages I'll read to you. Many of you are still sending messages on Domilevo's um, forced retirement. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is News File, your most authoritative news analysis platform. It is brought to you by Bank of Africa, as strong as a group, as close as a partner. MTN, everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Europlast, where Europlast goes, water flows. Having mosquito spray and coil. Pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects. And Napa foods. It's tasty. DBS Industries, anything roofing, looking for durability, that's where to go. Robert and Sons Limited Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care services provider. And talking about Nepa Foods, just reminds me that my friend sitting here is waiting for Alaji's wife, Wachi. <laughs> And we are all waiting for it. <laughs> right. OK. Of course, Independence Day. And uh, the reason we are all in, um, in Africa were uh, beautifully. Thank you all. And as you know, we end today's show at 12.30. And so I'm not in a hurry at all to go for Alaji's uh, yeah. wife watching. <laughs> right. So. Uh, just one or two comments from some significant commentators. Uh, uh, CDD's Kojo Asante says, does you really appreciate that we are talking about an audit, not some document sharing exercise? There is a reason why audits are done within a period. Otherwise, people can find clever ways to cover their backs after the fact. Nobody seems to appreciate the fact that Mr. Domelevo is an auditor 
and the rules of audit must apply to everyone, including the minister or the chief of defense staff. Domelevo was victimized for doing his job, nothing else. Um, then, <laughs> I see he's my cousin. Yeah, then Manasseh Azuri says that, tell Yao, everybody is saying tell Yao, <laughs> tell Yao Pong that it is untrue when he says the information was made available to the Auditor General during the audit. I didn't say so. It's false. I didn't say so. Yao Pong said the letter he referenced was dated October 2019. By then, the audit had been completed and the Auditor General had by September served the notice of disallowance and surcharge on the senior minister and others. This notice was issued after the audit had been completed. What is the nature of the evidence of work done that the Auditor General who audits the presidency, national security and defense and interior ministries cannot have? That is a question and then he attaches the Auditor General's letter he wrote at uh, that time. So, um, so, Doc, I was asking you the very final question, whether we should do something else or we should continue to do this if, after all, the nominees will be approved, then why waste the President's time? Why waste all of us our time in, in the House? And listening to the debates uh, when they were approving them, the majority members appear to simply say everybody doesn't have any problem. And some of them actually say this is a woman, she has children, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's go ahead and approve them. So like uh, Professor Kukwasari said, why don't you adopt a method where you give the president the free hand to simply do it? We are in March. It is now that the president is getting the compliment of his government. I have been... Um, Samson, I'm sure you know my position on this. I have been critical of Parliament in terms of its self-optimality since 1992 to today. So I'm the first person to, be, to, to, to criticize things Parliament do that I think are below what they were set up to do. The political reality of things uh, uh, can hardly be debated, and so it's difficult to change them. Parliamentarians are political beings. And so, as I indicated, the political maneuverings and the back channel, the back channeling of things, you know, those are things that happen in every parliament across the world. However, it is important that a certain degree of quality be injected into the process. And so, if MPs themselves or if the members of the committee themselves have identified certain clear weaknesses of certain MPs, then passing those MPs would have to, can only be justified if they show that there are superior reasons over and above those defects. Let's be clear, no nominee can be 100% clear of all the, of the three things that are listed, the capacity, the competence, and the credibility. No nominee can be 100% clear. Every nominee will come with some weakness or weaknesses or the other. It's important that Parliament then does the balancing act. The question is, in deciding whether to pass one nominee against the other, and in deciding to pass that nominee, you know, weighing some variables higher than the other, what considerations the parliament make, and whether or not the considerations parliament made are overall justifiable, given the balance of, of factors of strengths and weaknesses for and against candidates that were presented before the, 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 the committee. But the reality is, look, these things are heavily steeped in politics. I mean, these are political considerations, so you can't subject them to the legalities. The legalities are whether the person has been convicted before, whether he qualifies to be a member of parliament, whether he's a registered voter, you know, those are the legalities. Once the person passes the legalities, the others are political considerations. And for political considerations, the variables are highly subjective. And those are the ones that are difficult to negotiate or to, as it were, uh, criticize as we sit outside of parliament. So the, 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 the most important thing, particularly for the NDC, is to deal with the difficulty of the base uh, the base and the MPs disconnect. If you have a disconnect between the base and the MPs, then it can actually have serious political ramifications, some okay. of which may be in the character of negative votes against you at the next election. <laughs> and right. those are the worries that some of them have at the stage. But otherwise, those are political you know, wranglings and maneuverings, and you can't subject them to the legalities. Thank you very much. Uh, Clement Akapam says that the disquiet from the NDC on the approval of the ministers bring to the fore a bigger issue of the relationship between political parties and their caucuses in parliament. My view is that 
MPs must be independent of control and direction of their political parties, but, in de but dependent on the ideals and ideologies of their political parties. Well, you hear some people ask you whether you have uh, politicians who have any ideologies that they can talk to you about or espouse. Uh, this is a sure way to have functioning and principled legislature. The party uh, had an emergency meeting and called for a ceasefire and then promised that it will look into the matter. Then uh, this statement was also issued by and signed by Haruna Idrisu, the minority leader. He said, the past few days have been the most difficult for the NDC minority caucus in parliament following the approval of President Nana Adodanko Akufuado's nominees for ministerial appointees. Justifiably, the party's base and grassroots are unhappy in some instances and have had cause to reject and even condemn the decision of the House to approve the three nominees that went through voting. For many, it is unimaginable how they could pass the test in the hands of the same minority that secured them a Speaker of Parliament from an opposite party in the executive on the 7th of January 2021. Then he goes on to uh, pledge their resolve to ensure that in future they would uh, hold them accountable and then assures that nothing untoward uh, went on. The suggestions about people having been compromised are not correct. Then he ap uh, appeals for calm uh, among the rank and file. The very last statement, uh, paragraph I read, he says, we pray for calmness, even as leadership at all levels continue to offer us direction towards our coming victory. Be assured that the caucus is still the caucus of the uh, 6th and 7th January 2021 that achieved the unthinkable feat of electing the Right Honorable uh, Bagwing as Speaker. Let's keep the faith. May we all be measured in our utterances as we seek to rise together. God bless the great NDC sign, Haruna Idrisu. And he also sends a note to us to inform you that he doesn't operate any uh, social media, is it Facebook handle? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so be careful if somebody is on Facebook saying that he's Haruna, then he says he is not. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, so my attention is drawn to this. Let me read that quickly. Uh, Oliver uh, Bakavamawa says, I disagree with your opponent's uh, limited view of the parliamentary approval process. Parliament exercises the power to approve ministers on its own terms and on benchmarks it deems necessary to the role. If those terms are limited to only reading the eligibility criteria of MPs under the Constitution, then Parliament's role in appointing uh, in the appointment of ministers is unnecessary. Also, if Parliament's role is limited to the eligibility criteria uh, of MPs, then MPs nominated as ministers need not be vetted uh, by the same reckoning. Right.